Okay, so let's begin. Welcome everyone. Um, I wanted just to uh, continue where we left off last week. Um, the overall topic is the the image, the picture of, of, of King David, David HaMelech, through the Talmud Bavli. Uh, not that necessarily we should presume that all the Talmud Bavli has one point of view. I don't assume that. But there are certain, uh, I'd say, general, uh, a general sense one gets from the uh, primary discussions, primary studio in the, in, in the Bavli. We began last week with a rather famous statement of the Talmud. Talmud says in Tractate Shabbat, Ko Omer David Chata The Gemara says that uh, whoever says, thinks that King David sinned is, uh, is mistaken. And that statement, whoever says King David sinned is mistaken, and the reference is to the story of David and Bathsheba, that um, statement uh, is part of five statements made by the same person about five different people in the, in the Bible, King David being one of them, the sons of Ewe being another one, the um, sons of Samuel the prophet being another one, first one being Ruvain, Jacob's eldest son, and afterwards uh, King Solomon, Shlomo. In all of these cases, the argument is that whoever thinks that this person sinned, Chata, is mistaken, and each time there's a discussion and the Gemara asks the obvious question, how could one suggest that these people did not sin uh, when a plain reading of the Bible suggests quite the opposite? So anyway, that's what we discussed last week. And my basic point last week was that if we look at the larger context of these statements, the bigger context of this, uh, these statements that are found in Shabbat, the larger context has to do with the obligation that someone has to rebuke someone else who is doing something wrong. That's the frame of all of these statements. So the claim last week was that the idea of saying David didn't sin, when the Talmud here and elsewhere knows quite well that David sinned, but the point of it, the sort of the agenda, the, the, the lesson that's being taught is that whether someone sinned personally, that's one issue. But the responsibility devolves around upon the person who could have prevented something bad from happening. How much more so when the person himself was involved in, in, in effecting something very negative. So what's interesting is that um, you have in, in the handout over here, um, so the, um, we saw last week we, on the page, the first page that you have, it says Shabbat 55a, 2 to 9, and this handout be began with, uh, about several lines down, it talks about, um, Rabbi Zera said to Rabbi Simon, this we saw last week, uh, Rabbi Zera said to Rabbi Simon, let the master reprimand the members of the house of the exilarch. Rabbi Simon had some influence over them. And Rabbi Simon said, why should I rebuke the house of the exilarch? They won't accept what I say. And Rabbi Zeva said to him, nonetheless, should nonetheless rebuke them. So that's really the beginning of the whole sugya. You should nonetheless rebuke them. It's about rebuking people that did wrong. I thought a way to begin this evening was to look at the few lines above, the very beginning, on the top of the page. I'll read it in the, in the English, just because it's, for our purposes, it's more important just to simply get, uh, just to see what it says. So the Gemara says, relates that Rabbi Yehuda was sitting before Shmuel. Yotiv came to Shmuel. Atai ha'yitato kotzafka kameh. So a woman came, and cried out before him. So the woman felt there was some injustice being done to her, and she cried out. Shmuel paid no attention to her. So Rabbi Yehuda, who's a pupil of Shmuel, that's the, the Amorah Shmuel, not Shmuel in the Bible. He said to him, 
Shmuel was un- unresponsive to the woman's complaint, he said, he said, he said to his teacher, to his Rebbe, Shmuel, he said, what about the verse in Proverbs? Um, whoever stops up his ears at the cry of the poor, he will cry himself, but shall not be heard. He was critiquing his teacher. He was saying, this woman's screaming out about injustice, and you are silent. You don't help her. So Shmuel responded, and the response is actually very interesting. Amalei, Shinana. That's his nick, that's the nickname of Rabbi Huda, Shinana, big toothed one, whatever the reason for that is. Reshach Bikariri, Resha de Reshech Bikamimi, Ayativ Marukva Beitin, etc. He said to uh, to his pupil, to to uh, Rabbi Huda, he said, Your uh, your teacher will be punished in cold water, but the superior of your superior will be punished in hot water. That is to say, he said to his pupil, don't, I am not going to be punished for this. Punished in cold water means I'm not going to be punished. But, 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 the, but the head of the head, but the, but the chief, the, the, the president of the court was Marukva, he's the one responsible. As is written, Beit David ko amar Hashem, dinu laboker mishpat. He quotes, cites a verse, O house of David, thus says the Lord, Dinu Raboke Mishpat, judge with equity. R- r- rise up in the morning and deliver correct judgment. Save the, save the one who is, from whom things are stolen from the oppressor. Lest my fire come out and burn. And that's what it means to say, be judged in hot water. So what was Shmuel's response? Shmuel's response was, I'm not really responsible here. There's a higher authority and the responsibility divests upon the higher authority. So I am your head as it were, but the woman who's screaming to me for justice, she's she's going to the wrong address because justice must be served by the people who are in charge. Now, whether we want to just accept this at face value because one could argue, okay, the chief is, is in charge, but doesn't necessarily exonerate or exempt others from rendering judgment. That's a very good question. But the point over here, which is sort of the introduction to this whole discussion of King David, among others, um, it's interesting that the verse that cited is Beit Davido, House of David, rise up for justice in the morning. The person on top at the end of the day bears the primary responsibility. And that's the beginning of the whole discussion here. So therefore, um, in the very next story that we saw last week, Rabbi Zaira said to Rabbi Simon, why don't you speak to the Exilog's household? Because maybe they'll listen to you. The presumption being that somebody who has the power, perhaps, to, to make corrections, bears the responsibility. So it is interesting that this statement about the ultimate responsibility and the verse that cited about the house of David, that the discussion of King David, whoever says David sinned is making a grievous mistake, is mistaken. The Gemara actually, by trying to claim, making the dubious claim, I would say, that David didn't actually sin, is not there to exonerate David. It's making a totally different point. Even if technically speaking, he didn't sin, but the punishment meted out to David, which is a terrible punishment in the Bible, and we'll discuss that in the future as well, but clearly, David, the rebellion against David, the death of the child born to Bathsheba, the first child, the subsequent deaths of other children, David going into exile, etc., etc. That's uh, that's a reality. You can't dispute that. That is what happened to David. Why did that happen to David? And the Sugi is claiming not necessarily because he sinned. The, the presumption of the Gemara, which wants to make a point about responsibility is, even if he didn't personally sin, but the fact he, that he was responsible for what happened, the person on top, the king, the ultimate authority, the house of David, is the ultimate responsibility. 
So that's what we uh, want to just continue what we began last week in terms of this particular sugya. And I would point out that um, this sugya in Shabbat has some other very interesting features to it. Before we get to the next sugya, which is in uh, Sanhedrin, um, the sugya mentions five different people whom, uh, actually six, there's also a six, but primarily five people who any reader of the Bible understands are very responsible for some wrongdoing. And each time it makes the claim that perhaps whoever says they sinned, chata eno elatoe, two of them, one is David. Whoever says David sinned is making a mistake. And before that, we have the sons, the sons of Ailey. Before we, just one second, before we, um, before we move to the sons of Ailey, I want to briefly say something about the sons of Ailey. But here in the next, uh, in the next little piece in Shabbat, um, it talks about a, a kind of proof text to demonstrate that failure to reprimand others causes you to have responsibility. And what's interesting is if you see the continuation here, um, you see the continuation, it's a rabbinic interpretation of a story in the, in the book of Yechezkel. In the book of Yechezkel, uh, Yechezkel is taken to the temple and he is, uh, we are told that he sees that the uh, terrible punishment is being meted out against Israel. And in the story over there, uh, he is told to write uh, a, a letter on the foreheads of various people. Now, without getting into the details of Yechezkel, of course, it's a, the Talmud is presuming a certain interpretation of Yechezkel. But the presumption is that the letter that is written on the, on the foreheads, the tough, that's written on the foreheads of the people, which when you read it sounds like these are people that will be spared punishment. But the Talmudic understanding is that even these people will be punished. And on the page, it says towards the bottom of this section, right here, says, Amra Mida Tadin. So initially God was going to spare the ones with the with the letter on their forehead. They were going to be spared punishment. Amra midat hadin. So the the quality of judgment said before the Holy One, Blessed Holy One. Ribona Shalola, O Lord, Manishtanu Why are you sparing the ones with the letter on their head, with the tongue, as opposed to the others? So God responds to midat hadin, Sadikin The ones with the letter, they are fully righteous people. And the others, full-fledged righteous people, and those are full-fledged wicked people. So the, the quality of judgment said to God, Ribona Shalom, master of the universe, they, they, should have, they should have protested the misbehavior. So God responds to the, to the, to the judgment and saying, I know, says God, but had they protested, it would not have accomplished anything. They said they would have accomplished nothing with their protest. So the quality of judgment says to God, we bonus, O master of the, of the universe. Okay, you know it, but did they know it? And the continuation is that God says, you're right. God relents, God says, you're correct. They deserve to be punished as, as well. And all those with the letter tough on their head were also uh, punished or killed or whatever. And then the Gemara discusses why the letter tough, tough being the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So one interpretation is even though kept the, they kept the entire Torah from, from, from Aleph to tough, from, from A to Z, they kept everything. But failure to protest the, the misbehaviors of others renders you equally culpable. And that's a rather astonishing statement. 
the entire Bavli here is astonishing, where God is God is essentially uh, defeated by the quality of judgment, midat hadin. This is the only place as the Talmud with the, with the quality of judgment defeats God. God says, you're right. God says, look, they, had they protested, it wouldn't have mattered. You know that, but do they know it? So this is all part of the sugya, which frames all of these statements about David not sinning, about the sons of Ewi not sinning, etc. I did, before we get to the primary text I want to look at this evening with you, which is, has all kinds of interesting pieces and hopefully get some discussion and uh, it's very rich. But what's interesting is this, this, the, the, the Talmudic expression, Omar David Chata Eino Ela Toe. Whoever thinks that whoever says David sinned Chata is making a mistake. It says about all the five people, but two are in particular interesting because one of them, uh, David, when the prophet Nathan says to gives the parable of the of the rich man and the poor man after the Bathsheba incident, which is chapter 12, and you have this someplace, I cited the verse. So David says, after Nathan tells him this whole parable, I think it's further down, all the way in the bottom, you have it. And David says, Chatati Hashem, I have sinned against God. So David says, Chatati. And not only does David say, Chatati, um, that's in Samuel chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 12, but Psalm number 51, one of the more famous Psalms, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a Psalm which is written, the heading of the Psalm is, this is a Psalm that David said, they're right there, you have it. And David said to Nathan, I stand guilty before God, Chatati Hashem. And if you go down some more and you see Psalm 51, down up more on the page, Psalm 51, let's find that, Psalm 51, down on the page, the other way, um, all the way in the bottom, there's a series right there, Psalm 51, one of the stunning songs that we have. And David talks about his guilt and his plea for, for God's mercies and God's forgiveness. Verse number five, keep shy, ani eda, the chatati negdi tamid. For my, I know my sins. I'm aware of my sins, plural. But chatati, this particular sin, this this this, this sin, bacheva, negdi tamid, is 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 before me all the time. So first of all, David calls the bacheva story, the bacheva incident. Chatati. So you have David calling Bathsheba incident hate, both in the book of Samuel, Chatati Hashem, and an entire psalm dedicated to the story, a request for forgiveness, for purification. One of the great psalms that we have. And he says, uh, both in verse four, me chatati ta'areni, purify me from my sin in verse number four. And in five, he says more than that. My sin is before me forever. And that verse actually lends itself to do different interpretations, and they're both true. The translation here is, I am ever conscious of my sin. It's before me in my consciousness. That's one understanding of it. But, but actually, there's another possible understanding of khatati negdi tamid which the long sugi and Sanhedrin, we're not gonna finish it today, but that presents with a different possibility about my sin is before me forever, not just in my consciousness, but actually as a kind of reality. Because the question of course is, how do you, how can you change the past? How can you uh, blot out what actually took place? And that's something that the Talmud wrestles with in more than one place, but in particular, in terms of the famous Agadah about, about, about David and David's plea with God for, for, for forgiveness. We have, of course, Psalm 51, 
which is a very famous psalm. Uh, it begins with the word Chaneni. Chaneni, have mercy on me. And the, um, in the uh, Christian tradition, it's probably the most important psalm at all. Miserere, it's called. And there's a lot of very beautiful compositions of Psalm 51. In any event, here it's all about uh, forgiveness. And this is a psalm that appears in, in our tradition. Uh, many of the verses here with, we are familiar with because um, they appear in our, in our services. They appear in, 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 in Srichot. Al Tashricheni Nufanecha. Ruach Kotshecha Tukach Mi Meni in verse 13, part of the Slichot service. Don't cast me aside. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. And other verses here as well. Hashem Sfatai Tiftach Ufia Giti Watecha. Several of the verses we're very familiar with because they appear in our, in our service in various places. And David talks about forgiveness and about atonement and about purification and about being reborn. Uh, so it's hardly the, the I, uh, again in verse 11, Haster panecha mechatai, mechatai, turn away from my sin. The word chet appears several times in this psalm. So it actually is, as I mentioned last week, inconceivable that the Talmud Bavli thought that David did not sin. Because when it says whoever said David sinned is making a mistake, who said David sinned? Well, David said it. Let's start with that. And I would add, not only did David say it, but the Talmud Bavli says it as well in many places and in, very, in a very striking way. What's interesting is that the other personages about whom it says that they did, whoever says they sinned is making a mistake, the sons of Ailey. Whoever says the sons of Ailey sinned is making a mistake, well, the book of Samuel says the sons of Ewi sinned, Chatat Hanarim in chapter two, and the very and the very story itself where they are rebuked by their father. Their father rebukes them and says, "Listen, if if one sin against the other person, then perhaps you can turn to God and perhaps ask God for forgiveness. But if you sin against God, who's going to intercede on your behalf?" So that's what Ailey said to his sons. Im yechataish, right? But if, if you're chotei Hashem, who's going to help you? So there the text itself uses the very word chet to describe the sons of Ailey. And therefore, even in this text in Shabbat, which on the surface makes the claim that David did not sin, it's really not what the text is about. Clearly, the Talmud understands very well what it says in the Bible, but it's trying to make a different point. That was essentially what we saw last week. And I thought this week uh, we would look at uh, a different uh, excerpt from the Bavli, a lengthy one, we won't get through all of it. But this is a text in Tractate Sanhedrin, and uh, I like to look at uh, what this uh, text uh, all the way on the Kuf Zion, the very beginning, um, no doubt. That's it, right there. Right. So before that, if anybody has a comment or question, please speak up. And then we will afterwards pick up with the, the Talmudic text, at least begin the Talmudic text in Sanhedrin. I'd like to get through, this is all about David and Bathsheba. And then next week or the next time we will be finished with David and Bathsheba, I wanted to focus on what I think is incredibly interesting and a different story about David. And the Talmud takes us in all kinds of interesting directions. But let's begin. If anybody has a comment or question, please unmute yourself, speak up. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> I still don't understand, if after everything you said, why they say whoever says David sinned made a mistake. Because if, if the big point was about taking responsibility or either not to sin or to t rebuke someone else, David sinned and he was the big guy. So I don't, I don't understand. Right, what they mean by he didn't sin, when you, when you of course, in, in explaining why he didn't sin, 
it's clear that the questions that the Talmud itself raises uh, suggest very strongly that David did sin. Mm -hmm. um, my, the point is that he didn't sin in the sense that each thing can be, can be justified from a, from a narrow perspective. Did David kill Uriah the Hittite? Well, in the story, what he does is he brings, let me just, just very say something about David. I'm assuming everybody knows the story of David and Bathsheba, but I'll say it anyway. David and Bathsheba, David, there's a war going on and David to, against Ammon and David, for whatever reason, does not participate in the war. He sends everybody else to fight. It's the second Samuel chapter 11, but David remains in Jerusalem. He doesn't participate in the war. This is the second, this is the, the war had started earlier. And this is the second, you know, the second uh, segment of the war. For whatever reason, David stays home. And David goes to sleep in the afternoon. Chapter 11, he sleeps in the afternoon. It's not a siesta, that's a mistake. A siesta is when you sleep from one to two in the afternoon, it's very hot. David sleeps until the evening. He gets up at twilight. He walks on the roof and he sees this beautiful woman, Bathsheba. And he inquires about her. He's told she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She's the daughter of Eliam, both of whom are two of David's great, great warriors. And they're busy in the battlefield fighting the war, a war, by the way, that David started. So he inquires her, he summons her to the castle, he sleeps with her, he sends her home. And then she sends back a message to him, Hara Anochi, I am pregnant. That's the story. We can't get into the story of David and Bathsheba now, because we would spend the next 10 weeks on it. But the point is that there is a complication for David. Apart from the obvious complication, he got someone else's wife pregnant and one of his glorious noble warriors, the daughter of another warrior and the granddaughter, by the way, of his chief advisor. Achitofel is, is a grandfather. So there's a problem from two standpoints. There's a personal problem. There's also a political problem. Because the in that point in the book of Samuel, we don't know who David's successor will be. And what kings don't want uh, is the line of succession to be blurred. They certainly don't want that the next potential king of Israel, mother, has another man in, 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 in her life. So David sets out to solve the problem his way. David in the book of Samuel prefers to solve the problem without bloodshed. He prefers to solve the problem peaceably. Killing for David is a last resort, but it's a last resort that he can do and does. So he summons Uriah home for supposedly to get a report about the battle, of which he doesn't care. Then he sends him home to his house, hoping that he'll sleep with his wife, the beautiful Bathsheba, and nobody will know after eight months or whatever, when she gives birth, who the father is. In this way, problem solved. The child will not be his. We presume to be the son of Uriah the Hittite. And that's his first, that's, that's the way he prefers to solve his problem. The problem in the story is that Uriah refuses to go home. We can't get into why he refuses to go home. He, what he says is, and I take it at face value, by the way, some don't, that how can I go to my wife and my house, eat and drink, and the beautiful Bathsheba, when, this, my, when, my, when my, my general Yoav and my troops sleep in the field and the Ark of God is with them in the field, lying in the field, I should live in comfort. I can't do such a thing. David tries to get him drunk, send him home. He refuses to go. And then David hands Uriah a note, a sealed note, Uriah being the noble soldier. And essentially what the note says is, kill me. He said, deliver this message to Yoav, the general, and he's carrying his own death warrant. That's the story. Now, the point is, Yoav, Uriah is killed in battle. I have, my reading of the story is different from most people that I've read about what Yoav actually does. Not our discussion now. At the end of the day, bottom line is he's killed by, he's killed in war by the enemy. Now, 
Cherev B'nai Amon. Now the question is, when David is, I mentioned this last time, when David is killed, when Uriah is killed by the enemy, so from a certain standpoint, you could say, did David kill Uriah? You could say, well, David didn't actually kill Uriah. He may have caused his death, but at the end of the day, it's the general following David's instructions in one form or another who sets Uriah up. It's the Ammonites who, who kill Uriah. So from a certain technical standpoint, in terms, of, in terms of the act of killing, David did not kill Uriah. He caused his death, yes, but he didn't actually kill him. The Talmud, here that we saw last week, takes, this statement takes that position, didn't really kill him. And not only that, it tries to exempt David from killing Uriah by claiming that Uriah was guilty of some crime. He was a rebel against the king. Now, without getting to the specifics of it, and you gotta wonder how seriously the Talmud is taking that statement. But that's from one perspective. From the other perspective, which is the plain reading of the text, actually, killing Uriah this way is not just, just as bad as killing him yourself, but it's actually worse. You're using the enemy of Israel to kill one of your noble soldiers. You're using the war, the job of the king is to prosecute war, and you're using your very responsibility to carry out a war against Israel's enemies. You're using the enemies for personal reasons to kill one of your best soldiers. So from a certain perspective, you would say that using the sword of Ammon to kill Uriah is not only equally bad, but it's actually worse. And I think that's the plain reading of the text. You killed him, you took his wife, and even worse than that, you used the Ammonite sword to kill him. So it's not just you caused his death, you did it in a, in a using the enemy, and more than that, you did it in a sneaky way. You acted in stealth, you acted with deception. In contrast to Uriah, or Yah, the light of God, David acts in stealth. But the Talmud that tries to defend David, as it were over here, is looking at it from a different perspective, which is, did you do the act of killing? And the Talmud suggests whether it actually buys it from a moral argument or not, I don't believe it does. But the Talmud suggests that actually he's less culpable because he didn't actually kill him. He rather caused his death. And the Talmud distinguishes here between causing something to happen and actually doing it yourself. That I think is where it's headed over here. As I said, my argument is that fundamentally, the Talmud understands, of course, that this is not the plausible reading of the text on any level, but it uses, and that's what Midrash sometimes does. It uses a story to make a different point. It's making a point about responsibility and, and that's the point of the entire sugya, basically. And the more power you have, the more responsible you are. So that's the point I was making about, did but he David, kill him or didn't he kill him? But David behaved irresponsibly. He behaved immorally, that's yeah. of course. Now the Talmud wants to claim that Uriah was guilty of something, but we have to distinguish between a moral culpability on one hand, that's one way to look at it, which is how the book of Samuel looks at it. The book of Samuel couldn't care less if he technically killed him or not. I mean, I'll give you a parallel example. It's, it's a very important question because it's a good question in general, but it's actually central to the Sugya. Let me give you a simple example and we'll have to move on to the next mm -hmm. point. But let's say, for example, the story of Joseph and his brothers, right? The brothers hate Joseph because he boasts and tells them of his dreams. And um, so the, Joseph is sent by Jacob to find his brothers and he doesn't find them right away. They see him from a distance and they determine to kill him. Let's kill him, throw him in a pit. We'll say an animal, right? We'll say a wild animal killed him. We'll see what happens with his dreams. That's Genesis chapter 37. It says, and Reuven responded to them and he saved Joseph. And Reuven said, we shouldn't kill him. We can't kill him. Let's not kill him, but let's do something else instead. Let's throw him into this pit. Our hand shouldn't be against him. He's a, right? That's what Ruvain says. 
right? Yod al Tishnuchubo. His intention was to save Joseph. That was his intention. But so what was Ruvain's? We know Ruvain's intention, the Torah tells us. But what is Ruvain's argument to the brothers? He doesn't tell the brothers I want to save him. So what is Ruvain's argument? What is what is the distinction that Ruvain makes? Ruvain distinguishes exactly want to have this a way. Blood of his brother on his hand. If it, what, what happens if they throw Joseph into the pit? What's going to happen to Joseph? He'll die in the pit. He'll die, of course he'll die in the pit. The Torah says the pit has no water. Mm-hmm. And in fact, to be in the desert without water, you will die. So what does it mean? He's our brother, right? Let's not do this. Our hand shouldn't be against him because he's our brother. What does that mean? It doesn't say the word brother. A hand should not be against him. Don't kill him, throw him in the pit. So Reuven makes that distinction, actually. Reuven distinguishes between using killing with your, 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 your act of killing as opposed to causing death. Now, you might argue that it's more humane to kill him than throw him into a pit in the desert where he dies of thirst after two or three days. One could easily make that argument. That's not Reuven's argument. And when Judah speaks up in the story, Judah says, we don't make those distinctions. We are killing him. Three days, one day, two days, 10 minutes, it doesn't make a difference. We are responsible. You don't kill your brother, let's sell him into slavery. That's what Yehuda determined. So this issue actually, and it's an issue actually, in, it's a very interesting question in general about action theory, about to what degree do you think that if you do an act, you are more culpable than if you cause in the Talmud, there's a lot of discussion about this in various scenarios. But that is one way to read the David story. I don't think it's the way the book of Samuel wants you to read it at all. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make this distinction, but the Gemara is making the distinction for a different purpose. Okay, so this is the, this was the beginning of our discussion of, of King David. And now let us begin with the Sugi in Sanhedrin. We, they're about, 10 sugyot in the Talmud Bavli that deal with David in some rich way. This is a very long sugya, and we will begin with Sanhedrin, Dach Kuf Zayin, Omed Aleph. Let's start with the top. I'll read the English just because it's quicker. Rabbi, the fourth line in the English. Rabbi Yehuda says that Rab said, a person should never bring himself to undergo an ordeal. Ordeal here means a test. The English translation is not, this translation, I think it's Svari. I, I, there are points where I think it's less than precise, but our, okay. A person should not bring himself to undergo an ordeal, a test. As David, king of Israel, brought himself to undergo an ordeal and failed. David said before God, this is not in the, text of the Bible, but this is the rabbinic understanding based on Psalms, etc. David said before God, Master of the universe, for what reason does one say in prayer the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and one does not say the God of David? (laughs) That is the, right, that is, um, that's David's question in the Bible. How can we are praying to the God of the patriarchs (coughs) and not the God of David. I will say that was is interesting actually in terms of our prayers that the Psalms of David form a, in terms of what we actually say, not the core prayers that we have, which are the Amida, but David is mentioned in the Shemona Esrei in the Amida. And of course the verses that we recite before prayer, <coughs> Suke de Zimra, much of which comes from, 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 from Psalms ascribed to David. So he has a point, we do use David. David is someone that we are, David's prayers, David's Psalms, are something very central to our, to our tradition. <clears throat> In any event, David here turns to God and says, how come not saying the God of David? That itself clearly is, sets the tone for the rest of this. God said to David, they have undergone ordeals before me, and you have not undergone an ordeal before me. The Hebrew is 
Nasot to test. The word Nisa does not appear in conjunction with Isaac or Jacob, but it certainly does appear with Abraham. Elohim Nisa to Abraham. God tested Abraham. It's the binding of Isaac. So I, and here it's here it's it's it is uh, expanded to include Isaac and Jacob as well. I tested them, and they passed my tests. You haven't been tried or tested. So David says to God, verse in Psalms, David said to God, examine me, right? The Hebrew is, Hashem mm-hmm. try me, test me. That's David says, test me, examine me, subject me to an ordeal. God said to David, I will, sub- all right, I will subject you to an ordeal and I will perform a matter for you that I did not perform for the patriarchs. I'm gonna test you. But I give, I'll give you an edge on the patriarchs. Because when the patriarchs do we do two lo hodatinu, I never told the patriarchs that I'm testing them. I didn't tell them in what sense I'm testing them. But as far as you're concerned, I'm telling you straight out, I'm going to test you, and I'll tell you how I'm going to test you. I'm informing you, I will subject you to an ordeal involving a matter of a, of a married, married woman with whom relations are forbidden. Fine. So it's interesting, by the way, that here, the, this long text from the Bavli begins with David requesting that David be tested. Now, you know, in our daily prayers, in the morning, actually before the basic prayers, he said we have a blessing and a request of God. Out v'yenu l'deni sayon. We ask God, do not, do not subject us to, to a test. Actually, there's another Jew who said this too, Jesus of Nazareth, right? The, the Lord's Prayer, and lead us not unto temptation. So it's well within Jewish tradition. And we say it every day. Do not put me in a situation of temptation. Because you never know how you're gonna act under pressure. We don't know that. And David is requesting, you want, you want to be tested? What, the God of David? Okay. And I'm gonna even tell you what the test is. Arias, right? Fine. So now we have the following story. I would say that this, what's very important in the Agadot, and in, I would say in, in, in literature in general, maybe in life in general, it's tone. To pick up, to hear the tone. The, the texts have a music to them and to pick up the tone. This is how this thing starts. David says to God, how come they're not saying the God of David? So right away, it puts you on edge. <laughs> what? Okay, I'm gonna test you. And now we have the story of David and Bathsheba. And it came to pass one evening, David rose from his bed now, the story you recall, I mentioned this before, is that David, who doesn't go to war, is sleeping in the afternoon. He wakes up at twilight. The Bathsheba story takes place at twilight. And I've spoken about this many times. Twilight is the time when things are not clear. And that's actually central to the story of David and Bathsheba. But the Talmudic text over here, the Medrash, is wondering, why is David sleeping in the afternoon? And he wakes up at night. Rabbi Yehuda says, once David heard the nature of his ordeal, he sought to prevent himself from experiencing lust. He transformed his nighttime bed into his daytime bed. So he's sleeping with his wives in the daytime, basically. He thinks this way, okay, I'll... David has very strong sexual drives, but he's going to... Uh, perform these sexual, his, his sexual acts in the day, but not in the night. But it says, but he forgot, he forgot a so-called halacha. Not that this is a halacha, but it means a way of life. He forgot a basic idea. That is, the more sex you have, the more sex you want. That's essentially what it says over here. So when they're already interpreting, they're, they're interpreting the story in an interesting way. He sleeps in, he sleeps in the daytime, but now at night, 
he's walking around and he's trying to purify himself of, of any kind of lust. Now, let's see if we can move this down a bit. Let's see. How do I move this thing down? I have no idea. Move the page down a bit. Okay. Fine. Stop, stop, stop. Right. So now, um, now we have the following story. This is, this is not in the Bible, but the story is interesting. It says the following. It quotes the verse, David and Bathsheba. He walked upon the roof of the king's house. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. That's, that's, that's in the text. So he sees Bathsheba. Why David is walking on the roof is a very good question in terms of the plain meaning of the text. And the, the Bible never says why David's walking on the, on, 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 on the roof. He walks on the roof of the palace. Of course, from the roof of the palace, presumably, it's the tallest building in, the, in town. You can look and you can see all kinds of things that normally you wouldn't see. From there he sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof, uh, bathing, bathing, not on her roof necessarily, but from his position he can see this. I will add that in the text of Samuel, the idea of being on the roof is not inconsequential. The roof in the book of Samuel and the Bible in general is a dangerous place. Torah says it. Mm -hmm. When you build a house, put a parapet upon your roof. Let somebody fall from the roof. Mm. Do not place blood in your house. Do not have a dangerous place. The book of Samuel uses the roof in more than one story. The roof is a dangerous place in the book of Samuel for a different reason. Because the roof means the top. When you're on top, there's only one place to go, which is down. So the gog is dangerous. David is walking on the gog. There's a sense that the sense of self-importance, which you have in the Medrash here too. Medrash picks up on these things, these fine points. How come they don't say the God of David? How come only the God of Abraham? What about me? Test me. I can withstand temptation. This is the, it's interesting, by the way, in the book of Samuel, the other king of Israel is Saul, the first king of Israel. His downfall, person responsible for Saul's downfall, Saul's responsible for Saul's downfall. But the immediate cause of the downfall of Saul is Amalek. And the king of Amalek's name is Agag. It's not an accident. Agag. Gag from the word Gag. Gag the highest one. Mm -hmm. Haman's the Ag Agagite. He's above all the others. So being in the high place, it's responsibility. It's also great danger. Very dangerous. David walks on the roof. And here we have the Agada of, these, of, of Sanhedrin. He walked on the roof. Here it says the following. Bathsheba was shampooing her head behind a beehive. So it means that she was concealed from sight, as the translation says. Satan came. Satan came and appeared to David as a bird. David shot an arrow. Potak be Gira. Gira is an arrow. David shot an arrow, Potko Rechauta, and there is no bird, but instead the arrow hits the beehive. Igalia Bechazia. When he hit the beehive, the beehive disintegrated, and behind the beehive is the bathing Bathsheba. That's the story here in the Bavli. It's complete, this is not in the text at all, obviously. And when you read this, you ask yourself the question, what is the, what is the Agada driving at over here? What is the point of this? What is the point of the story? I'll make a suggestion. These texts are very rich, actually, because they're rich in and of themselves. And on top of being rich in and of themselves, making all kinds of interesting points, often very deep psychological points about the characters, they tend to, for the most part, counter to what many people may think. The Agadot and the Bavli usually are critical of somebody, often themselves, often the Tanaim and Amoraim. Few people escape unscathed in the Talmud Bavli. But they're also interesting in terms of 
uh, kind of, in, in, they, they, they're also interpretive. They're also picking up typically on something in the story. I would say, first of all, in this, in this description of what happens, so Bathsheba is not someone who is bathing that anybody can see her. She's behind the curtain, in this case, behind the beehive. Um, but something happens to expose her. And what exposes her actually, and the, this is the cause of David's troubles, the person who is responsible for exposing Bathsheba is none other than David himself. The, the, the Satan over here, the Satan, you can understand the Satan in many ways, but often what Satan represents is the kind of is the kind of negative energy or kind of a kind of demonic side that every person has. But the, like the snake in Gun Eden. Like the snake, Yetzirah. It's the and so basically what's interesting is that the person in this Agada so far, the person who is responsible for David's problems is none other than David himself. First, by requesting the test to begin with. And the point of the test is to demonstrate his great virtue. And then secondly, he shoots an arrow at this bird, and there is no bird. And in doing so, he exposes Bathsheba. And what's interesting about these Agadot is that in thinking about why this particular image, shooting the arrow at the bird and exposing Bathsheba, I'll just make, for example, it's very open-ended. We can all think about what it might suggest. So I'll make, I'll make one suggestion here as to what it might be alluding to. Bird often represents the idea of, of, of bird of course is flight, often flight to freedom. And what's interesting is that there is actually a story in the book of Samuel which I think is recalled by what this text is saying. You remember in the book of Samuel, David is convinced and correctly so that Saul wants to kill him. And he goes to Jonathan. In fact, we just read this, I think. I mean, Machar Chodesh, it's the Hak Torah, when Rosh Chodesh falls on Sunday. And David says to Jonathan, your father's out to kill me. And Jonathan says, I don't think that's true. Yes, he's out to get me. So Jonathan says, let me, let me see if it's true. If it's true, I will warn you and I will give you a message and you'll, 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 be, able, you'll, you'll be able to run away and escape. And if it's not true, you, you'll come back to, uh, to the king and everything will be wonderful. So on Rosh Chodesh, there's a two-day festival and David doesn't show up to the king's table. And the first day David's absent, King says nothing, suspects. Second day, he's convinced David's a rebel. David's a, a morid b'malchut. He is a, a rebel against the king. Of course, in the book of Samuel, the great morid b'malchut is none other than David himself, obviously. And he's determined to kill David. So Jonathan goes out to warn David with a prearranged signal. And what is the signal? The signal is that Jonathan will shoot arrows. And if he tells the young man with him, come closer, come closer, it's safe to return. If he says to David, he says to the young boy, David's hiding. He says to the young boy with him, go farther, go farther. David will hear this and know to run away immediately. So Jonathan shoots the arrows and he calls out to the boy, hurry, hurry, don't stop, hurry, run, don't stand still clear message to David to run away, to flee. And David doesn't flee right away. David rushes out and bows down and hugs, kisses Jonathan as a sign of thanksgiving, seeing a great... So that story is very interesting. There you have the story of flight and the arrows precipitate the flight and David lives for another day and David can become the king of Israel. And the story over here about Sheba, when David almost loses the kingship, so the Agada frames it in such a way that you sort of remember the moment where David flies to freedom. And in the story over here with the arrows, 
which are not there to save anybody, but rather to kill this bird. David is a hunter in the story. And that precipitates quite the opposite. It precipitates his fall from grace, as it were. Perhaps that's the text that the Agada wants us to think about when we read the story over here. In any event, what happened was David shooting the arrow exposes Bathsheba. Now we have to remember that the Agada is probably picking up on something else in the David story, which is that both in the story of Uriah the Hittite, remember that David gives Uriah a note, which essentially instructs the general Yoav to, to, to have Uriah killed in the war. Uriah bears his own, de- his own death warrant. And in the story afterwards, when Nathan the prophet confronts David, Nathan does not say to David, you have sinned. Nathan says something very different. I come with a, with a question, with a Shiloh, oh judge, because the king is a judge. There's a rich man and a poor man and the stranger comes to town and the rich man takes the one lamb of the poor man and prepares it for the stranger. The rich man has many flocks. What should be? And David says, terrible person deserves to die and pay fourfold. This person is ruthless. He has no compassion. And Nathan said, you are the man. So in the- Rabbi Silver, I know yes. I'll let you go on. I just wanted to say, there's something here that I never liked. It kind of puts Yonatan immediately into a precarious position with his father. It's awkward. He has to go out on a limb. It's another form of moral, uh, you know. Uh, well, I think Jonathan puts himself in that position. I don't think that. Right. I, but he, you know, yeah. okay. All right. I think there's a deep affection between the two of them. Uh, I think that Jonathan sees David as, I mean, without getting to the details of it, I think Jonathan sees David as as, as appropriate for kingship. Um, and I don't think that from that, in that relationship, I don't think that the text sees it as something. Jonathan is a right. noble person. It, so no, it's what, it's what it does to the relationship between Shaul and Yonatan, but you can go on. I'm just saying it always bothered right, me. Right, but you, you raised some very good questions. They require a lot of a lot of thought, and I have a lot of thoughts about that. But yes, it's true that Jonathan is caught betwixt and between. That is true. He makes a choice to support David. That's his choice. In any event, my point is that in David Bacheva story, it's about, it's kind of quid pro quo. David pronounces his own death sentence because he has Uriah carrying his own death sentence. And in, in, over here, what they're picking up on with David is that David is um, David is responsible as it were, David sets up his own, his own downfall. He sets it up by a, a request that I think is inappropriate or immodest. He sets it up by, by preparing himself in the wrong way for a test and tests are dangerous things. He shoots the bird, exposes her, and then of course, this is the test, but he uh, of course fails the test. He knows who she is. He knows she's a married woman. Nonetheless, he summons her to the house. And David says, David says later on, David says, oh, that a muzzle would have fallen upon the mouth of the one who hates me first to himself. And I would have not said anything like, so David regrets in the story, um, David regrets putting himself in the situation. Let's move down a little bit. We have one more minute. Just move the page down, please. A uh, little, yeah, so right, right, fine. So if we look further down, we have the following statement. We'll have to continue this next week and I hope we finish this next week. I want to move on to other statements in the Talmud. There's a lot here. Um, David's, um, the, the Talmud then continues in David's response to the Bathsheba story. And let me just begin it now in any event. Uh, let me make one point about this. It's extremely rich text. I'll make one final point about it. If you read about 15 lines down on the second page, Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, was designated as fit for David from the six days of creation. But she came to him, it says, 
just as Eve was designated for Adam. But Sheva was designated as fit for David, he partook of her unripe, unripe before the appointed time. There's something here that's actually I find extremely interesting, and we'll have to continue this next week. The point of this statement is you have a case of, I mean, it's, it's adultery which turns into murder, basically. And even beyond that, for the book of Samuel, it's misusing your, your, your position in society. It's misusing your trust, which is to prosecute the wars, to fight the enemies of Israel, to be equitable, to be fair, to be a judge. And you misuse that, use the war for personal, for personal gain, for personal profit. What's interesting is that, and what I find interesting about these agadot, this in particular is interesting to me, that it presents it, not that it's justifying David in no manner, shape or form, but it says something very interesting about Bathsheba. Bathsheba is actually David's partner. In other words, Bathsheba was really right for David. When he sees Bathsheba, it's not just lust, actually, what's interesting, the way that in the text of the Samuel, it may be just lust. But over here, there's something else about it. He sees this woman who he sees as right for himself. And in this Agadah, she actually is right for David, but not at this time. She was fit for David, but he partook of her unright. This is not right. She's married to somebody else. This is not the right time. The setting is wrong. But it's actually very interesting. And in point of fact, what they're picking up on is something very interesting in the book of Samuel. In point of fact, the child born to David and Bathsheba dies. But the second child born to Bathsheba, Solomon, he's the next king of Israel. So there's something about Bathsheba, actually, that is appropriate for David. But the time is not right. So they're picking up on something which is interesting. It's an affair. It's wrong. It's deadly wrong. It's terrible consequences. <laughs> but why this particular woman? Now we'll see next week that the next section of this Agada, which talks about David, is, I'd say, rather unsparing in its, in its view of David. But sees David is very, very human. Um, and paints, I think, a very interesting portrait of David that perhaps could be derived from the biblical text, but not necessarily. And they pre they're presenting David in a certain way. It's not an attempt to justify, I think, so much as to understand the human condition. And David at the bottom, at the bottom, at, at the bottom is basically a, a person with certain drives, etc. So the position... But there certainly is no attempt to justify David, and nothing that we've read here so far in any manner, shape, or form can be seen as a justification. So where we're going to move with this is, if someone have comments or questions, I'll take them now. I'm going to, this presentation, I'll stop now. We'll hopefully next week continue with this, and then we will move to another text, which is, in, I think, very fascinating, very rich, and we'll have to spend a lot of time on that text. Someone has comments or questions now. Can I say something, Baba okay. Silva? Of course. Uh, just a thought. Where are you, anyway? What? Where are you? In uh, my apartment in New York. Oh, you're in New York. Okay, fine. Um, Go ahead. I think it, it might be interesting to check uh, how, much, how is David um, described in the Palestinian uh, sources. Because if it's, as I would suspect, that it's more important to the Bavli to make a tzaddik out of David rather than the Yerushalmi, I would think that it has to do with the fact that the Rosh Galuta, the Rosh the Exilach, yes, exilach, yes. was supposed to be from Bet David. Yes, that's true. So for the Babylonians, it's important to make to clean David out of any um, sin. But uh, I think we can see, if we check the Palestinian sources, then we, we can see, do they share this uh, lovely picture of David or, or not? Well, I would say two things, Sarah. First of all, I don't think that the Bible has such a lovely picture of David. 
I think the Bavli has a scathing indictment of David. That's number one. Number two, that actually in the Bavli, in the statement, whoever says David sinned uh, is, um, is making a mistake. So Rabbi, who's a patriarch, makes that statement. And Rob wow. says about Rabbi, because you come from the house of David, that's why you say it. So it's oh. actually the, the patriarch more than the exilarch, actually. So your point is well Very taken. interesting. But Rob says it straight up. Okay, uh -huh. you, come, you, 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 you come from the house of David, uh -huh. that's why you justify it. But I don't actually believe the Bible intends to justify David, period. And it's not, the interest here is not, of course, that's one point. But the deeper point, what interests me is the sort of, the sort of psychological profile that we get from who arguably is certainly one of the main characters of the Bible. David wasn't wrong about that. And there's more in the Bible about David than anybody else, just about when you count the book of Chronicles and Samuel and Psalms. And so he's a central character, but he's a, a, in the book of Samuel, a very flawed character. But the Bavli, I think, you know, it sort of expands our thinking about David in some interesting ways. We'll see this, I think, next week, and even more so when we get to a different uh, Sugi in Sanhedrin, which is extraordinarily interesting, I think, both as an interpretive text and interesting in its own right. Does anybody else have any comment they want to make Thank now? You. Yes, Rabbi, if I may real quick. Yes. Can you hear me? I just thought it was interesting from a literary perspective, the use of the arrow, because he's supposed to be in war where you might be shooting an arrow and instead- right. Excellent point. Point. Excellent point. Yeah, that's an excellent point. You actually had it in mind early and thank you for saying it. Right. The point of the story, of course, that's an excellent point, because one of the big questions is, and we don't know the answer to this, why is David not in the war? The text makes the point, he sent this one out at the time when kings go to battle, that's how the chapter begins. Everybody but the king is going to battle. So yes, he is, he has the arrow there is used, not in the context, I put it in terms of Jonathan and David, which is, but it doesn't contradict. Another possible illusion is exactly this point, and that comes to a different point that emerges from the book of Samuel. When do we get in trouble in life without exception? When we're not in the right place. That's always the case. <laughs> now, David didn't wake up that morning thinking he's gonna become a, he's gonna murder one of, his, one of his best people. He didn't go to work that day. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he's bored. We have an English to walk the walls, an expression. Maybe he's had enough, who knows? Maybe he's old. The text says it doesn't tell us, but your point is very well taken. The very arrows, which are used in war, right? And with David's eulogy for, for Saul and Jonathan, Ulami that B'nai Yehuda Kashet, to teach the children of Judah the bow, how to, how to bow and arrow. We have to teach how to use this in war. Jonathan was a, a bowsman. So the point is, yeah, the point is well taken, that he's using, he's in the wrong place. Instead of shooting the birds, he should be shooting the enemy. And that's part of, part of the problem with David Bathsheba. Okay. So we'll stop at this point then. Look forward to continuing next week with all of you. And thank oh, you. Rabbi, for thank you. Thank Rabbi, you. Quick, quick question, Rabbi. Yes, yes. It's, it's Sandra, hi. Yeah. Um, in the Agadah, with the reference to um, choosing the right mate, maybe the wrong time, but the right mate. Yes. Is, is there any even tiny indication or reference to um, the uh, chapter, cha the chapter in Breshit where um, uh, Adam is searching for the right mate. I know that the Agadah connects Adam Harishon and David. Yes, it um, does. Yes. So I'm wondering if this is a sub silencio kind of reference to them also, that, that at their very essence, uh, searching for the right mate or for the right mate for whatever particular reason in, in Adam Harishon's um, uh, situation on, in chapter two, you know, he saw all the others uh, mating and had nothing for himself. So it involved some level, maybe, maybe not, of s sexual envy. And then we have David here in the wrong place looking for a mate, even though he has multiple mates already uh, for whatever, as you indicated, wrong sexual reasons. And, you know, so in other words, is there another right here, sort of a sub silencio connection? I think the, my answer is yes. I, I think that is the case. I think that that story is, is, I think the text itself, maybe we'll see next week, 
there's so many pieces to this agada, but I think what you're saying is, is actually right. I think that okay. I think it, it is it is it is present in the story. Let me just maybe find the final word on this would be the following. The idea of the right person, but not the right time, that's actually the way the Song of Songs ends. Shira Shir, <laughs> the great romance. It's Brachto di, run away, my beloved, flee my beloved. It's not saying goodbye, Jolly. That's not what it's about. It's saying it's right, but, but we aren't ready yet. That's, and that's, we read this on Passover. It's the beginning of our story. Mm. We're not ready for this relationship to be completed. But it, it, it's the right person, but the time will come. You can't, you can't rush it. It's got to be the right time. And that's what they're saying about Bathsheba, which is, I think, very, it's a very deep point, you know. Yes. Not justifying anything. He meets this woman, and she's married to somebody else, and he thinks it's right for him. Now, that's what the Medrash is saying, the Agad is saying. And you know what? It actually is right for him. But it can't actually yeah. happen. Yes. And that's that's something very powerful point about these Agadot. The Agadot are very rich because they're very real. But they're not to justify. There's no justification here. But that's what it's saying. And in, in point of fact, she is the queen mother later. Her son Solomon <coughs> is the next king of Israel. Okay, so we'll stop at this point. Looking forward to the next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank, thank you, Rabbi Silver. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.